Labour has never done well in a UK election without doing really well in Scotland. We need deposit ATMs and we need withdrawal ATMs and we need a law that means that businesses have to accept cash. UK workers have had the most bargaining power essentially since the 1970s because the jobs market is so tight. Can Britain actually afford to maintain a global military presence? You're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Ewan Potts. And I'm Caroline Hepker. Welcome to the programme today. We'll be going to PMQs in just a moment. And also we'll be hearing from Ray Newton-Smith, the economist who's uh, the head of the CBI, Confederation of British Industry. Yeah, I can't believe it's the first PMQ since the autumn statement. It seems like ages ago. And it's been something of a mixed week for the PM, I think you could probably say. He's gone from announcing £30 billion of foreign investments in the UK and courting business leaders at a Tudor palace to a minor diplomatic instance with the Greek Prime Minister after cancelling their meeting at the last minute. Something about marbles. Uh, hang on, not minor. I, I think it's actually developing into something of a uh, major test. But anyway, that aside, yes, it has been an interesting week for the PM. He'll be at the UN uh, Climate Change Conference, of course, in Dubai later on this week. That's COP28. So today he's got a piece out, opinion piece in The Telegraph, all about trees. Yeah, well, trees are popular, aren't they? I think everybody likes trees pretty much. Mm -hmm. And the Prime Minister wants more of them. He's uh, written in this piece about the vandalism of the sycamore gap tree in Northumberland. Remember that big, beautiful tree, which was... Two months ago, I looked it up. Yeah, I I don't think they've actually caught anybody yet. They've they've questioned a few people. Mm. Um, He's selling it. Yeah, he says that the British people want to uh, turn this moment of anger into a moment of action. Yeah, um, so there's going to be a new second national forest and another national park, so actually England's 11, so a little bit uh, more money. I thought that what the PM said was quite interesting, that he shared the nation's profound sense of anger in response to what had happened at Sycamore Gap and that it shows how much the British people uh, love, have uh, loved um, the natural world. I think this has made some people very happy, people like the National Trust, others not so much. I mean, Labour point to, you know, sewage in our waterways as um, you know, showing how poorly the Tories have done on this issue. Yeah, well, national parks certainly are popular, aren't they? There's been discussions about an 11th one for some time. Mm. Of course, it's not without some controversy, because if you have a house in a national park, it does make uh, it makes planning issues all the more complicated. And we already know they're, they're quite tricky. So restrictions on development are, are very much to the fore uh, in well, national parks. Who's he trying to appeal to then? Well, I think... I mean, I think national parks are broadly popular aren't they and, yes. and having a new national forest it's all fairly uncontroversial stuff isn't it so perhaps he felt he needs to do more on the green agenda ahead of cop and you know the government's uh, perhaps tarnish its green credentials a little bit with the rollback of the uh, net zero stuff and the, on some of those targets so i think perhaps they realize that they need to appeal to that constituency a bit more yeah no absolutely i mean i think the issue though again is is if you know it does this clash as you say with the attempts to try to make planning speed to try and increase um, building in terms of homes um, that is an issue and also I think it's about what you use those green spaces for I think if you speak to environmentalists you know just having a national park they don't have overall authority Um, it's not the be all and end all in terms of the answer to the depletion of the natural world of of habitats and so on Um, and I think even in London if you're a Londoner all the green spaces in London are having to you know make a bit of money they're often handed over at the weekends for events and so on the dual usage of green spaces yeah i think lots, lots of those events are rather fun aren't they but i suppose it depends what you think uh, a, <laughs> chris caroline's giving me a look I suppose it, it depends what you think the, the parks are for well yes but that's my whole point it's it's the london issue writ large what do you think the national parks are for you know are they are they meant to be uh, wilderness uh, areas uh, open to all you know how how should they be managed but anyways an, inter- an interesting telegraph piece from the pm yeah i think the thing about national parks is that they do a lot of them do attract a lot of tourists i mean you go to the lake district in the summer and it sometimes feels like it's busier than being in the city doesn't it really i mean it's they there, there is space for nature but some of them are very crowded i think some of the less known ones perhaps are better for nature but yeah certainly the popular ones you know they're swarming with tourists d- domestic and international yeah okay um i mean obviously your favorite national park then um i like the yorkshire dales yes um i like dartmoor where Dartmoor is, nice. is fantastic. The Peak District. Yes, yeah. Dartmoor is beautiful and and rural and um, uh, yeah, no, definitely. Getting out of London is a good idea. And the New Forest is very nice as well, which is not too far from these parts. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that in terms uh, of the PM then, um, I mean, I suppose it's, it, it also clearly is an issue around COP28 and the delegation that the UK is going to send to Dubai. I mean, there has already been a huge controversy about COP28 because it's being led by um, an oil exec. Here's Chris Dahmer. In an effort to hide from his failures, the Prime Minister spent this week arguing about an ancient relic that only a tiny minority of the British public have any interest in. Mr Speaker, that's enough about the Tory party. In 2019, they all promised the country that they would control immigration. Numbers will come down. The British people will be in control. How's it going? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let me be crystal clear. The levels of migration are far the levels of migration are far too high, and I'm determined to bring them back down to sustainable levels. That's why we've asked the Migration Advisory Council to review certain elements of the system. We're reviewing those findings and we'll bring forward next steps. But earlier this year, we announced the toughest action ever taken to reduce legal migration. The effects of that action are yet to be felt that will impact 150,000 student dependents and forecast show that migration is likely to drop as a result. But all we've heard up until this moment from the Honourable Gentleman on this topic is a secret backroom deal with the EU that would see an additional 100,000 migrants here every year. (laughs) Mr Speaker, never mind the British Museum, it's the Prime Minister who's obviously lost his marbles. Mr Speaker, the Greek Prime Minister, the Greek Prime Minister came to London to meet him, a fellow NATO member, an economic ally, one of our most important partners in tackling illegal immigration. But instead of using that meeting to discuss those serious issues, he tried to humiliate him and cancelled at the last minute. Why such small politics, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, of course, of course, we're always happy to discuss important topics of substance with our allies, like tackling illegal migration or indeed strengthening our security. But when it was clear that the purpose of a meeting was not to discuss substantive issues for the future, but rather to grandstand and relitigate issues of the past, it wasn't appropriate. But furthermore, 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 when specific commitments and specific assurances on that topic were made to this country and then were broken, it may seem alien to him, but my view is when people make commitments, they should keep them. Mr Speaker, I discussed with the Greek Prime Minister the economy, security, immigration. I also told him we wouldn't change the law regarding the marbles. It's not that difficult, Prime Minister. The reality is simple. He has no plan on boat crossings and migration is at a record high. A record high. His policy is that companies can pay workers from abroad 20% less than British workers. That has contributed to those record high immigration levels, hasn't it? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, he talks about the boat crossings. He's failed to notice illegal boat crossings are down by a third this year, Mr Speaker, thanks to every one of the actions that we've taken that he opposed every single time they were raised. But look, Mr Speaker, no one will be surprised that he's backing an EU country over Britain. Just this last week he was asked, just this last week, just this last week he was asked which song best sums up the Labour Party. What did he come up with? Well, Mr Speaker, he showed his true colours and chose Ode to Joy, literally the anthem of the European Union. And he will back, he will back Brussels over Britain every single time. Let me get this straight. The Prime Minister is now saying that meeting the Prime Minister of Greece is somehow supporting the EU instead of discussing serious issues. He's just got dug further into that hole that he's made for himself. And ever, rather than deal with the facts, 
he's prosecuting his one-man war on reality. <laughs> and that, that reality is stuck. Under this government, a bricklayer from overseas can be paid £2,500 less than somebody who's already here. A plasterer, £3,000 less. Ah. An engineer, £6,000 less. Ah. The list goes on. It's absurd. Labour would scrap his perverse wage-cutting policy. Yeah. Why won't he? Yeah. 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 Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, we have taken significant measures and will bring forward more. And indeed, as the ONS themselves said, more recent estimates indicate a slowing of immigration as a result of the things that we're doing. But I am surprised, Mr Speaker, to hear him now taking this new position, because I've got a quote here from a pushy young shadow immigration minister who said, and I directly quote this person, he told this House that limits on skilled migrants are, and I quote, a form of economic vandalism. Who could possibly have taken such a bizarre position to only then U-turn? It will come as no surprise to anybody that it was him. Mr Speaker, there's only one party, one party that's lost control of the borders, and they're sitting right there. And this is a government not just in turmoil, in open revolt. The Immigration Minister thinks the Prime Minister is failing because apparently nobody will listen to his secret plan. (laughs) The former Home Secretary thinks he's failing because of his magical thinking. The current Home Secretary thinks he's failing. He even took time out of his busy schedule insulting people in the North East to admit he agrees with Labour. The Prime Minister seems to be the only person on the Tory benches without his own personal immigration plan. (laughs) Clearly, his own side don't have any faith in him. Why should the public? Mr Speaker, it's it's really a bit rich to hear about this from someone who described all immigration law as racist, who literally said it was a mistake to control immigration. We have taken steps and we will take further steps, which is why recent estimates of immigration show that it's slowing. It's why next year the immigration health surcharge will increase by over two thirds. It's why immigration fees are going up by up to 35%. But Mr Speaker, when one of his own members of his front bench said that having a target isn't sensible, right? It's no surprise, Mr Speaker, to have people like this, because this is the person, Mr Speaker, while we're taking all these measures that he opposed, this is the person who stood on a platform and promised to defend free movement. On their watch, migration has just trebled. And he's giving the House a lecture about targets. He's lost in La La Land. There can be few experiences more haunting for the members opposite than hearing this Prime Minister claim that he's going to sort out a problem. (laughs) First, he said he'd get the NHS waiting list down. Uh, They went up. Unabashed by that, he said he'd get control of immigration. It's gone up. Following that experience, he turned his hand to bringing taxes down. And, would you believe it, the tax burden is now going to be higher than ever. It is ironic that he's suddenly taken such a keen interest in Greek culture, when he's clearly become the man with the reverse Midas touch. Everything he touches turns to... uh, Maybe the Home Secretary could help me out. So, will the Prime Minister do the country a favour? We neglect, we'll have to check the tape again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think. So, will the Prime Minister do the country a favour, warn us what he's planning next, so we can prepare ourselves for the disaster that will inevitably follow? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of the year, we said, Mr. Speaker. Oh. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, at the beginning of the year we said we would halve inflation and this government has delivered, easing the burden on the cost of living for families everywhere. But we know his plans, Mr Speaker, all the way through that. What did he do? Back inflationary pay rises. He talked about welfare, no controls for welfare and borrowing £28 billion a year that would just make the situation worse. He mentioned tax, Mr Speaker. Just this past week we've delivered the biggest tax cuts since the 
families, for millions of people and businesses, increased pensions and benefits, and this week secured £30 billion of new investment for this country. So he can keep trying, Mr. Speaker, to talk. Oh, oh, Britain isn't listening. Can I just say to the Shadow Foreign Secretary, oh, order just a little bit quieter, please. I want to hear. Right, Ramanchisti. Okay, so that was, well, um, a slightly difficult ending there, wasn't it, Um, for PMQs? I felt it was quite testy. Keir Starmer actually looked like he was having fun, which I think is quite a rare description for him. (laughs) And Rishi Sunak, to my mind, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit angry, actually. Um, Although the Prime Minister defended himself robustly, saying, you know, just the Conservatives just delivered the biggest tax cut since the 80s, with increasing benefits, increased uh, pensions and seen investment increase. But, of course, that is in the face of the criticism from Keir Starmer around rising immigration numbers, rising NHS numbers and it, taxes going up, the tax burden overall going up. And I think those are very significant criticisms. Yeah, I, w- I wonder if Keir Starmer's got a new joke writer. They, they, were, they were quite good gags today, actually. Sometimes they, they fall a little bit flat. I mean, he's not a sort of natural stage comedian, is he? But yes, yeah, quite good little quips. I mean, I guess kind of jokes about old marbles and, and, and relics. It, 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 <laughs> it, it, they're quite, they come quite easily, don't they? But yeah, he had some... Uh, some some good uh, jokes about the PM losing his marbles and the Tory party being an old relic. Um, but then also, um, I thought lines that were quite pointed around, you know, why is the Prime Minister engaging in such small politics, as uh, Keir Starmer put it, you know, not to meet with the Prime Minister of Greece. And of course, because he, the Labour leader, did yes. meet with the Prime Minister of Greece, which is I suppose quite normal because he's ahead in the polls and so perhaps he would want to get a view of what the opposition leader was like a year out maybe from the next general election Um, but yes I do as I mentioned at the beginning of the show perhaps that that issue around the Parthenon uh, marbles or the Elgin marbles um, whichever um, term you use that it does look to be unravelling a little bit the cancellation of that Greek uh, meeting with the PM. Yeah and I thought very interesting that the, that the leader of the opposition was trying a bit of kind of triangulation on uh, if you remember that phrase triangulation on immigration talking yes. about the government uh, allowing people into the country working for 25% less money saying that Labour would stop that or at least implying that Labour would stop that so I thought that was that was very interesting actually very keen to go in on the issue of immigration which uh, the Labour Party isn't always yeah no absolutely and the other issue of course of conflating you know there are two separate issues there's there's boats which is illegal migration and then there is the legal migration numbers and it's the overall migration numbers that have gone up anyway that was pmqs want to turn our attention though to from the pm to the chancellor because lizzie burden and i have been speaking to rain newton smith who's director general of the cbi she's coming out herself a very turbulent period it's been six months since she was rehired promoted to the top job of the business lobby group after a series of scandals. Rain uh, has led the organisation through this difficult time. She says the Confederation of British Industry is now succeeding in being heard by government. This is our conversation with Rain Newton-Smith. It was so great last week to be able to have our countdown to general election conference and be able to welcome the Chancellor and uh, Johnny Reynolds, the Shadow Secretary of State for Business and Trade and and many great business leaders and and commentators and emerging leaders to, to talk about raising the business voice ahead of the the general election and and that really felt like an important moment and and of course last week we also had the autumn statement and i think there were some really important policies that were set out there that we have been campaigning on and thinking on, thinking about on behalf of our members and and to see that delivered in the autumn statement was really important for us as an organization but yeah i was there at your countdown to the election event and I was speaking to other people who frankly were saying it was amazing it was happening because there was a doubt whether it something like that could happen again. And I wonder in the time that you've been CEO if there's anything you would have done differently. I think in so many things, right? You, there's always things that you can learn uh, and and reflect on. And I don't know if I can pinpoint you know any one specific thing, but have I learned and grown as a person through this challenging time absolutely I think the thing that has stayed with me is just how important it is to to listen to people whether that's 
you know, businesses who are our members, those who aren't, uh, and really understand what's on their minds. Uh, and the same with our staff as, as well. And I think that's what's been difficult about the, the crisis is we are an organisation. Was, was it the right decision in your view to have a female leader after sexual misconduct allegations against your predecessor? I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Look, I think these decisions shouldn't, it shouldn't be about gender. I think it's about having the right person to lead the organisation forward. If people had raised issues, if there were things that needed to be addressed, I thought, I tried to reflect on, on what women who, who may have raised issues at the CBI or any time in its history and, and thought what they would have, um, what was important and, and reading some of the reports I read in, in the media, I, I suppose I came back on something that I think is fundamentally important, is that when women raise issues uh, within organisations, they want those organisations to change. They don't want them to fail. They want to see change. You know, I think that's what we all want. We want to see change in our society. Uh, and I think that is something else that really spurred me on to uh, to help do what I could to lead the organisation forward. So how do you think those women would feel about Tony Danker, your predecessor, saying he was made the fall guy for wider organisational problems? So I think one of the things I've been really, that's been really important to me in coming back into this uh, organisation and leading it forward is I don't want to comment on, on individuals uh, or individual behaviour. I think it's really important that I look at our organisation now and say... Am I sure that we are adhering to best practice, that we are building the right culture and, and living and breathing that every day? But, I mean, I speak to male business leaders who say that there's this obsession with ESG and it's verging on witch hunt territory. I wonder whether Me Too is being applied too harshly to the city in your view. I don't, I wouldn't recognise it. I wouldn't characterise it like that. For me, what's important is that Women and men in any organisation, whether that's in financial services, whether that's in any company in the UK, whether that's in uh, in government, in government departments, in the NHS, I think what's really important is that people can raise issues that when uh, they see behaviour that they don't think is acceptable, they feel they can raise that and they're supported in doing that, but that you also have due process. You mentioned the autumn statement as being... Uh, hugely pivotal. What did you make of the tax cuts, um, significant portion of which were aimed at business? Do you think it's a return to austerity? We're back to a sort of quite negative uh, bit of rhetoric again about um, people in work, people not working hard enough, the kind of skivers and strivers type messages. Is that helpful? Having full expensing made permanent and uh I suppose to articulate what that really means it's really about having a, a capital allowance for business investment that is there and part of our permanent tax landscape and that keeps us competitive on a global scale uh, having that as a permanent policy I think is really important because if we look at business investment as a proportion of GDP in the UK we do lag behind our G7 peers. Dan Needle the tax specialist in the UK said that the best thing that any government could do is simply to pick a tax policy and stick to it for five years and to say that they're going to stick to it. The chopping and changing of policy is surely the main destructive element of it. Look as business leaders would absolutely say that having predictability and certainty in the tax landscape is really important and I think again around capital allowances that's why it's it is an area that we now have cross-party consensus because we've seen the Chancellor set that out and the Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves has also said she would commit to uh, continuing with that policy so I think that gives uh, continuity and I think more broadly what we need to see is a plan for sustainable growth and a way of funding our public services uh, so that we have stable public finances. Because what I hear from businesses is that Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, is giving them the red carpet treatment, but there isn't that much difference on policy. In fact, they're not getting much detail on policy. It's just all about the tone. Look, I think over the course of the next few months, we'll see that policy articulated by both sides of, of the House. Obviously, the Chancellor set out uh, the autumn statement. I don't think that's the end uh, for fiscal policy by any means. I'm sure that we'll see more uh, actions and, and developments into the spring. And I think what we've set out to, 
day is our business manifesto where we have tried to say what are the things that are really important to drive sustainable growth in the UK, whether that's thinking about how we make the most of the green growth opportunities that are out there, how we make sure that the we have the uh, skills and wider policy to really uh, ensure we're attracting talent to the UK and developing our talent that is here uh, already. So I think we've tried to set out areas which where we think are really important to businesses. And I think we'll see both parties and any party campaigning in this uh, election. They'll be working on their manifesto. Does it matter that Rachel Reeves could be the first female British Chancellor. I mean, Rishi Sunak says it's great that he's the first British Asian Prime Minister, but he's even more proud that it doesn't matter. I think it's a couple of things. One, I think it does matter over the longer over the longer term, right? I think it's really important where we see uh, leaders around, you know, thinking about race and ethnicity or thinking about uh, female leaders. I think certainly I can remember as a young economist, you do look up in organisations and, and you look to leaders to see is there someone you can relate to. What I also feel is uh, people in leadership positions shouldn't be judged on the basis of whether they, uh, you know, whether they're a female leader or or male or, or around their race and ethnicity. So I think that's probably what the Prime Minister was trying to articulate as well. But then if she is the first female Chancellor, should she be radical on addressing the gender pay gap? I do think gender pay gap reporting has been really important and us as an organisation have also said we should be looking at ethnicity pay gap reporting and moving beyond making that voluntary for how we drive change in our society. But what we want from Rachel Reeves, if she were to become Chancellor, is for her to do that job extremely well. And I think that will be important. And I think it will be a moment of celebration for female leadership for us to see a female uh, Chancellor when, you know, when and if that happens. The problem with the gender pay gap reporting, though, is that despite the reporting, and Britain has been at the forefront in this, it's not actually made a difference. The gender pay gap has stagnated for at least five years years so the reporting is not enough you're absolutely right reporting is not enough in isolation but i do think the reporting is important in focusing uh, across government across businesses around the measurement and understanding where they are and where progress needs to be made and i think for it to really have value it it's we need to think about how we support women in work what policies do we have around childcare what uh, policies do we have that really make it easy for women to stay in the workplace throughout their careers so it can't be done in isolation as a leader leading other business leaders how are you navigating the rights and protections around trans rights at work as a business organization i i don't want to to you know say what's right for other people i think for me personally i think it's important that everyone can bring their whole selves to work that they feel they can be themselves at work and that they feel supported uh, to do that and and that's what's important for me as as an individual leader and i think it's helpful to have open discussions to know what what people, whatever their gender or gender assignment is, that they feel supported in the, in the workplace. I just want to ask you, Rain, because it's been an incredibly stressful year. I can't imagine having done your job. How do you cope with the stress? What's been the hardest thing coming back to the helm? How do I cope with the stress? I've got an amazing uh, supportive family. I have got four children. They keep me very grounded. I think, you know, if I've got teenage daughters uh, at home, I think many who know me well also know I'm a great lover of the outdoors, of spending time with friends, doing sport. I am one of those, I'm afraid, who loves to, uh, well, love is a strong word for it, but I do have the ritual of going every, at least once a week and swimming in a cold lake with, friends and You're a cold I, water swimmer. I am a cold water swimmer. <laughs> So that was the CEO of the Confederation of British Industry, Ray Newton-Smith, speaking to Lizzie Burden and I. Well, that's it from us for today. If you like the programme, don't forget to subscribe and give it five stars so that other people can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen. This episode was produced by Tiwa Adebayo. Our audio engineer was Marufal Hussain. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Ewan Potts. We'll be back with more tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg UK Politics. Listen weekdays at noon on DAB Digital Radio in London.